remarks and answers to questions at a barbecue for the press in the live oak tree grove of the LBJ Ranch, December 27th, 1963. Secretary Rusk is going to Houston to uh, meet uh, Chancellor Earhart, and before he leaves, uh, he make a very brief statement to you, and then Secretary Freeman is returning to Washington, and he have a statement for you, and then when they shall have concluded and you've eaten all the barbecue you want, why, I'll tell you some of my secrets. Secretary Freeman uh, spent the morning riding over the ranch with us and seriously considering buying one of these heifer calves, but we haven't agreed on a price yet. I'll let him tell you all about it. I want you to meet uh, Tom Mann, who came down this morning and who's uh, been in meeting with us and had lunch with us. As you know, he's the new assistant secretary in charge of Latin America and the State Department, special assistant to president, and will take the oath of office uh, January the 3rd. He will also uh, take over the duties uh, now performed by Mr. Moscosa, who uh, will uh, receive another assignment, and I'll go into more detail with that later. But uh, Mr. Mann will become the coordinator of the Alliance for Progress, the job now held by Mr. Mann, uh, by Mr. Moscosa. And uh, it'll give us better coordination there and also will save us some money. And we'll go into details with that a little later, but I want you to meet Mr. Mann before he leaves. I think you want to, I want to ex extend a welcome to the newspaper man from the Federal Republic of Germany. We are, we're very happy to have those of you who have been able to come early, and we look forward to meeting others later tomorrow. We hope that you enjoy our barbecue and soft drinks, and we'll see you when you've concluded with your meal. <laughs> that is, we'll have no more that we're aware of now. First, we have the announcement that uh, I've invited President Adolfo Lopez Mateus uh, of Mexico to uh, meet with me in Southern California on February the 21st and 22nd, 1963. This invitation to the President followed an invitation to uh, President Mateus and myself to receive honorary degrees from the University of California at Los Angeles. The invitation for the honorary degrees was extended by Governor uh, Brown, President of the University of California Board of Regents and the Board of Regents. The university plans to hold a special convocation in the morning, Feb February 21st, following a luncheon in Los Angeles, which is currently in the state of planning. The two of us will fly to Palm Springs, California, where we'll meet on Friday afternoon and evening, February 21st, and Saturday morning, February 22nd. President Lopez Mateus has accepted the invitation, and they will make their own announcement in due time. We, federal civilian employment was reduced by more than 1,000 during November and stood 3,500 lower than the end of November last year. Special significance of this is that if federal employment had grown at the same rate as the population, and 400,000 new employees would have been added instead of been able to make a reduction of 3,500. If federal employment had grown at the rate of state and local government employment, 100,000 new employees would have been added. So you can see uh, that we're trying to at least set a good example. This reduction was achieved mostly by not replacing employees going off the federal payroll, failing to fill vacancies. Overall, there were 2,470,571 regular employees of the federal government at the end of November 1963. Of this total, 42% work in the Defense Department, 24% in the Post Office Department, 7% in the Veterans Administration. All the rest, uh, if you don't mind, I ask them not to take pictures while we're going on. Just please. All the rest of the work of the federal government is done by 658,000 employees. Major reductions in the federal workforce were made in the Veterans Administration of the Tennessee Valley Authority. These reductions were partially offset by seasonal employment increases in the post office 
and increased requirements of NASA's manned lunar landing program. The federal government must be a model of competent and efficient management with economy the watchword and an end to waste is our goal. Secretary of Defense McNamara's recent announcement relating the closing and reduction of activities 33 defense installations taking in line with my announced goal of economical operation of all agencies of government has resulted in mail that's about five to one supporting the action. A telegram from James E. Bent, president of the Greater Hartford Connecticut Chamber of Commerce says that the directors of the chamber passed a resolution which said in part that the Greater Hartford Chamber of Commerce commends president for his action working to reduce spending by all departments of government and commend Secretary McNamara for his courageous step in ordering the closing of unnecessary military bases. A Seattle, Washington man cabled the secretary that he had five children coming up and I back you wholeheartedly on intelligent cutbacks. A Rock Hill, South Carolina man cabled closing unneeded installations, a brilliant move. Thomas Nelson, corresponding secretary of the Queen Anne Democratic Club of Los Angeles said, at the club at its monthly meeting heartily endorsed our action. We are heartened by your courage and leadership. A retired bishop from Cambridge, Massachusetts wrote Secretary McNamara that as an humble citizen I shout with joy that somebody's got the nerve to face up such criticism to save the country money without cutting down necessary defense machinery. A Houston, Texas man wrote, I want to congratulate you on the economy moves reported in yesterday's papers. A New Brunswick, New Jersey businessman wrote that this will be painful, but with the support of President I feel sure you will accomplish your objective. I want to point out that before these installations were closed, uh, uh, the secretary gave us his judgment that every person employed at any of the installations could be offered another job if he's willing to move at some other defense installation where there existed vacancies that had not been filled or where, the, where these combined installations would need more people. So, number one, everyone could have a job uh, at some other installation. And number two, the secretary felt that he could not justify spending a single dollar on any of the 33 installations. A uh, good many of them were uh, archaic. They were performing work that could be better performed if consolidated and combined elsewhere, and no additional expenditures could be justified. At uh, my direction, the secretary has now appointed a board of top Department of Defense officials to step up the study of military installations which have been going on since 61. The secretary named Assistant Secretary of Defense for Installations and Logistics Thomas Morris to head this board with the Assistant Secretary for Installation and Logistics from the three military departments. In naming the board, Secretary McNamara said, since early 1961, we've been conducting review of military installations. In view of our president's direction to get maximum efficiency out of every dollar spent, we're going to intensify this effort. So I'm asking Assistant Secretary Morris and the representation of the Army, Navy, and Air Force to apply themselves more vigorously to this task so that we may have the maximum results in the earliest possible time. Secretary Morris's base utilization division, composed of civilian installation experts, commissioned officers in three departments will of course carry the bulk of the load as they have done so admirably in the past. The new board will supervise studies to identify additional unnecessary insulation which should be reduced or closed during the next several years. While each insulation change is a matter of serious concern to the individuals affected, we're confident in the national interest we cannot properly justify maintaining any insulation which does not truly contribute to a strong defense in the most economical manner. So You'll have these releases, and you don't need to copy all this material. I want to review them with you briefly in case you have some question. I'll, I'll try to uh, either refer it or answer it. I do want to point out that there is a mistake in Pierce Allinger's girls that he brought down here from the uh, East Coast. They, <laughs> they say, Office of the White House Press Secretary, LBJ Ranch, Hugh, Texas, H-U-E-T-E-X-A-F. <laughs> yeah. He didn't misspell Texas, but he did misspell high. <laughs> and I don't want any of you to follow the announcement literally. Correct all mistakes before using, please. <laughs> Another observation I want to make is I gave Pierre uh, that jacket he has on today because it's too large for me to wear. <laughs> or too small. I, uh, <laughs> Mr. Moscoso will be appointed U.S. Representative of the Inter-American Committee on the Alliance for Progress and the U.S. Representative on the meetings of the Inter-American Economic and Social Council of the Pan-American Union. 
He will act as special advisor with the rank of ambassador to the Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs, Mr. Mann. Mr. Mann will assume Mr. Moscoso's responsibilities for administering the Alliance for Progress. His first job will be to explore all the possibilities for increased efficiency as well as operating economies which may be obtained through the exercise of this combined responsibility for the work of inter-American affairs. These changes, designed to facilitate better use of United States resources, both private and public, promoting economic development and social progress in Latin America. United States assistance programs supplement the self-help measures taken in other American republics. Those are five uh, little announcements that we have to make, and we'll make others uh, from time to time. I spent the evening uh, working on the briefing papers for the meeting tomorrow. I will join uh, uh, you in welcoming Chancellor Earhart at Bergstrom Air Base in the morning at 10 o'clock. This morning, uh, I had a chance to take a long walk with the Secretary of State and Assistant Secretary of State and uh, other folks who visited me. I had breakfast with uh, Mr. Uh, the head of Central Intelligence Agency, Mr. John McCone. He brought me up to date on affairs around the world. I asked him to, uh, uh, I directed him to uh, uh, seek an appointment with uh, President Eisenhower and to review with uh, President Eisenhower uh, uh, some of the matters that he briefed me on this morning and uh, to also uh, uh, bring him up to date on uh, the action we'd taken on some suggestions that he had made uh, prior to the time I appeared before the joint session of Congress. Mr. McCone left shortly after 10 o'clock and the secretaries came in and I had a private meeting with the Secretary of Agriculture in which we discussed a more comprehensive farm bill to be considered the uh, next session of Congress. Uh, we we'll talked about the results of his meeting with the farm organizations and talked at some length about uh, uh, my talks with Chancellor Earhart with regard to the common market area and uh, our export of agriculture commodities and uh, our access to the common market area. I talked to Secretary Mann at some length about uh, many ambassadors for Latin American uh, uh, nations, uh, about uh, some of his deputies and personnel generally in his new organization. I talked to both Secretary Mann and Secretary Rusk about the reorganization of uh, our various aid programs and attempt to effect efficiency and economy and discussed with them the work that's being done under the direction of Mr. Ball, as chairman of the group, and Mr. Gene Black and Sergeant Shriver and the group that's studying reorganization of our whole uh, uh, relation with other nations in the field of economic and military assistance. Uh, in due time, we'll have uh, more thorough announcements about that, more complete uh, with regard to military aid and Latin American assistance, as well as uh, whatever may be recommended in the way of consolidations on the entire aid program. I think that's all I have to say this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to take a ride to horseback, and then I'm going to study briefing papers until I go to bed tonight, and I'll see all of you in the morning. In the meantime, if you have any questions that are burning and need an answer and I can help you, I'll be glad to do it. Mr. President, could you give us any idea what uh, Mr. McCone will review with General Eisenhower, what the nature of those suggestions? Yes, it will be the budget for next year. The steps that we have taken with regard to affecting economies in the federal government the ceilings that we placed on each department, the new targets, the goal that we'll have, the uh, uh, economic uh, conditions that we anticipate for next year, uh, the uh, uh, general uh, uh, intelligence uh, developments from uh, information from throughout the world. President, this a, uh, uh, with, uh, as you've indicated, popular support for the closing of unneeded military installations running so strong, do you have an explanation for this fierce opposition to the closing from many members of Congress? Yes, I think that each congressman and senator that represents his area 
be expected to uh, express the hope that we'd give very careful attention to uh, the economy of that area and the effect and impact that closing the uh, installation would have. And a good many of them have done that, but they've been very reasonable and very prudent. And most of them have taken the position that if they could not be justified in the national interest by the executive department, to, that they did not want to see them continue to operate to, uh, when they were not needed. Uh, the point I want to make about that is this every congressional district in this country that has a defense installation must understand that they're going to be reviewed from time to time and uh, uh, we are not going to be just satisfied with the status quo. When Mr. McNamara came in this administration we had 6,900 bases. We cut out 400 of them, we still have 6,700. That's not bad arithmetic, that just means we've built some missile bases in addition to the ones we already had. So uh, we must constantly uh, we must constantly review uh, these installations and combine them and consolidate them if we are to operate at peak efficiency. And uh, we want to save every penny we can, every place we can, so that we may have some uh, much needed funds to fill unfilled needs. Uh, educational needs, health needs, uh, poverty needs generally. And uh, we think it's much better to curtail the production of uh, unneeded uh, military armaments and take the money saved thereby and put in educating your children and following the form of course uh, or taking care of the health of your citizens or providing security in old age or medical uh, aid or things of that kind. So we're combing with a fine-tooth comb every department and every individual agency. Uh, after a meeting with the cabinet the other day, we, in a three-day study, we came back with recommendations to the budget that reduced it $731 million and eliminated more than 10,000 jobs. I have a cabinet officer coming a little later in the week to tell me how he succeeded in reducing his request for, by 5,000 jobs. Uh, the Secretary of Agriculture told me today that he is very proud of the fact that he had reduced his request by in excess of 4,000 jobs. So uh, uh, we're trying to have the cabinet set a good example in the hope that the people down at the lower echelon will increase their productivity and without increasing expenditure. Mr. President, does this uh, briefing of President Eisenhower indicate a continuing relationship between you and him? As a it means that the President of the United States is going to uh, keep uh, the ex-Presidents of the United States fully informed and seek their counsel and advice from time to time. I've had extended uh, conversations with Mr. Hoover, first with his son, who uh, talked for him over the phone right after I uh, took the oath as president, later with the President Hoover personally, and uh, just uh, uh, Christmas Day uh, I had another conversation with him. Uh, he has uh, given me some very constructive suggestions on the operation of the federal government that grew out of his experience. We are studying those suggestions. We're applying them where they're appropriate. The Hoover Commission reports have been very carefully evaluated uh, since I became president. Uh, president Truman has given me his suggestions on uh, uh, how to increase efficiency and affect economies and operate the federal government. And General, General Eisenhower has uh, spent a good deal of time working with me, and I found all of them to be very cooperative, and I'm very grateful for it. Mr. President, how important a part will the East-West relations play in your talks with Chester Earhart? Uh, the, the most important part. There's nothing more important than uh, East-West relations. And as I have uh, said to you on other occasions, and I won't take an opportunity to repeat, uh, we the most important thing in the world to all of us is to live in a world of peace, to learn to live together, and we're going to go down any road that can possibly lead to peace and express the hope that all the other leaders of the other nations will do likewise. And uh, we believe that there is progress that can be made, and we're going to do our best to do our part. We have no doubt but what the Chancellor will uh, 
have the same feeling and what other world leaders uh, have the same feeling. I uh, once said that I had served with over 3,000 men in the Congress in 32 years that I've worked and served there, and I don't believe I've ever seen a man, either Republican or Democrat, that ran on a platform of doing what is wrong. They all want to do what's right, but sometimes their ideas about what's right and wrong differ some. And I don't think that I know any leaders of the world that uh, uh, wouldn't prefer peace uh, for their people. Now the job is to how to secure it, what the road to follow, and we are going to be a constantly, genuinely searching for that road. <coughs> There have been some optimistic reports from Germany about the recent common market uh, uh, discussions, particularly concerning the industrial goods. Reports from Mr. Earhart will say that they're going to be outward looking and so on. So I wondered if this tied in with your uh, knowledge and information on this subject and if you found it uh, encouraging. I'd probably talk uh, most, more, much more fully after the visit uh, rather than anticipating it ahead of time. Although you know our administration uh, went at great lengths and made great sacrifices to pass the trade bill last year, and we are very hopeful that we not only will continue to have uh, uh, increased opportunities for trade in, uh, in the industrial field, but that uh, we'll also have access for agriculture commodities. Mr. President, No, I don't think so. Uh, uh, the, uh, I might say that the Senate uh, uh, asked me uh, if it made any difference what day they took up the bill, and I told them it was a, a matter for the Senate to determine. And uh, I'm sure if Senator Goldwater had been around that he would have known that. <laughs> and I'm, I, I, I made uh, no special request of the Senate to, uh, about their holidays. Uh, they determine when to have them, and uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, they, in their wisdom, are determined to go ahead and try to complete some unfinished business. And I believe the people of this country want us all to. Uh, uh, of course, they understand when we have to be away on account of sickness or, or something, but uh, I think they, generally speaking, they want us to get our work done, and that's what I want to do. Mr. President, when are you going to be prepared to talk uh, politics, for example, whether you will yourself enter any primaries, uh, what your own plans will be about the Oh, I imagine when we get caught up with all these other things, I don't want to, I wouldn't, uh, if you've got plenty of time on your hands, I wouldn't mind visiting with you about it sometime in the near future. Uh, Mr. President, uh, you have to ask someone. Returning to foreign aid was the uh, action of Congress in uh, sharply reducing foreign aid funds a factor in your appointment of this review, interdepartmental review committee? I have felt for some time that we ought to constantly appraise our expenditures and evaluate them and try to bring them, modernize them, and, and uh, there had been uh, a very strong report by the Committee on Foreign Relations for, for all of whose members I have great respect for, and uh, I did consider that and uh, recommended, but I have some definite views of my own, and I communicated them to the committee I appointed and on how the Alliance for Progress should be handled, on how military aid should be handled and on how the development loan fund should be handled, and they're considering my views and, and all other information they can get, and they'll come up with a recommendation, and if they're close to my views, I hope they'll be, we'll probably adopt them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.